So, hello everyone, I'm Barak. Um, today we'll be talking about um, yeah, the Houdini spec, um, and we'll get exactly to what it is. Um, I'll start with the mandatory short introduction. Um, I'm a web developer based in London currently, um, even though after being here for a few days I'm starting to reconsider my life decisions. Um, but I've been doing web uh, and front-end development, web development and design um, for a long time, um, back when Marky and Blink were still working and not deprecated. Um, and I've seen the web um, transition through different phases, JavaScript and CSS through CSS 1 and 2 and 3, and JavaScript um, ES 5 and 6 and now 7. Um, and our tools and our languages that we're using evolve all the time. Um, and what I want to talk to you about today is how can we deal with this ever-changing, probably the most dynamic environment um, in programming and in uh, development today. So really what we're, con we're talking about is magic. Um, it's the magic behind CSS, how to understand it, and how we can make our own magic. But before that, let's talk about the parts of CSS that are not as magical. There's a term in Japanese called chindogu. And chindogu is the art and tradition of building over-engineered, sometimes seemingly useless inventions to solve um, everyday problems. Um, yeah, so we can see some really great examples. Um, and they are, you know, at, at the end of the day, these are useful, but they're just seemingly um, over-engineered. And how does that relate to web development? Where can we see over-engineering in our daily life? Well, let's talk about rounded corners. Rounded corners, up until a few years ago, um, before border radius became ubiquitous, the wet dream of all web developers, the entire web went rounded. Um, with Web 2.0 and Apple's inspired design, we all wanted bordered, border radius on our divs, and we used it everywhere. But the problem was that the adoption um, of border radius in browsers was not um, clear cut. It was not uh, available across the web um, immediately. So we were building our websites on our powerful MacBooks and fancy uh, Canary Chromes and latest versions of everything. And the latest and greatest of CSS was working perfectly. But when we were work, uh, when you open um, a website on IE6 or 7 or 8, you'd be horrified. And all, all the work that you've put into um, your amazing website, and it just looks like crap, doesn't work, the layout breaks, it's a disaster. So we started becoming inventive, and we invented our own border radius. And let me just find my mouse. There we go. We invented our own border radius. Um, and if any of you recognize this, we started using images to render them to the color of our divs, and we created our own border radius. I think that qualifies to the definition of over-engineering. Um, and why do we have to deal with these problems? Why do we have to render images to pretend that we have border radius to make sure that they're visible to everyone? And the answer is the process of CSS standards. How do new features of CSS end up on the web in the browsers available to everyone? Well, we start by proposing a feature. Each part of CSS starts as a feature proposal. And we can say, I think border radius is a great idea, um, and we should have it. Well, you go on to write a spec to detail an API to say why it's beneficial, to give examples, to write a mock implementation. And then the vendors, Chrome, Firefox, and Safari, they go on to implement um, that spec, the, the CSS spec. And then people update their browsers, um, and they get uh, better and better, better adoption of new features, and only then can we use these features. The problem is that between vendor implementation and browser adoption lies a chasm where CSS specs go to die, um, and features can spend years there. If you look at the implementation of Flexbox, it was several years, and we're still battling that today, even though adoption's pretty good, um, before at least majority of users, um, above 70 or 80% um, had browsers supporting Flexbox. And rounded corners is sort of a nice to have, but if your uh, layout is dependent on support for Flexbox and it's not there, everything is gonna get messed up. And I'm sure you're familiar with this, can I use um, charts that are often very depressing, telling you that only your version of Chrome supports this one thing that you were hoping to use everywhere in your project. Um, and it could be really disastrous to, to a web project if it's open on older browsers um, and everything's completely broken. So what usually happens is that there's uh, feature proposals, someone comes up with some kind of workaround and we just go with that workaround because we're too afraid to just go with uh, 
the fully fledged CSS um, implementation. And then we use it. The problem is that these uh, implementations are often, as we said, over-engineered. Using images for border radius anywhere on your website is not feasible. It's a lot of images. It's a lot of weight. It's a lot of work. Um, implementing Flexbox in JavaScript can become very slow and very sluggish and can bring the performance of your application down. Um, so what I'm here to tell you now um, is that you can make your own magic. You can, um, with a new set of tools that will be available to us hopefully in the near future, make your own CSS, create your own implementations, and not have to rely on uh, polyfills or workaround. And when I first saw this, it was mind-blowing to me, um, the kind of stuff that we'll be talking about today. And the APIs that Houdini, that is the code name for the task force, and this collection of APIs makes possible. So yeah, Houdini is the CSS spec that you'll give you um, web magical powers. And we'll see exactly uh, what that means. Uh, but to be able to understand what Houdini does, we need to first understand how the web works and how CSS works um, and get into the details that we usually uh, avoid and we usually don't dig that deep. Uh, we know how to use CSS, we know quirks mode, uh, we know behavior in different browsers, but not necessarily the engine itself and what the browser does when you give it HTML and a style sheet. Well, what happens is a process with four stages. You start with the style sheets um, with what's called the CSS object model, which is how do we map a tree similar to a DOM of all of the different properties and classes and elements. Um, we uh, uh, propagate through the cascade and we assign different properties of different importance uh, to particular targets in our DOM. Uh, we run through a layout phase, uh, which is where we organize all of the elements in the page uh, in their final structure, be it block elements or inline elements, um, different kinds of displays. We go through a paint phase where we actually render these components um, to, to a visual, uh, to different layers, and we go through composition. And composition will place those layers on the screen, and we'll end up with a fully uh, rendered web page. So we'll go through a few examples of the Houdini spec APIs and explain how they give you better access into the internals of CSS. And the first one is the CSS parser API. Um, it might not seem very exciting at first, um, but let's see what it looks like. So the, you can see that that's a bit small, so I'm going to zoom that in a bit. You can't really see at the back, right? No? OK. What did I just do? Command P, Alt P. Ooh, we went quite a long way back. Yeah, more GIFs. Here we go. OK. So, and we'll carefully zoom this back. OK. So the first thing that we can see that we do is parse the style sheet. We have a, uh, an API in the browser in JavaScript to get a CSS rule and get back the properties and the values. And we can do the same with uh, a style sheet, we can fetch a style sheet and pass it to a CSS parser, which will be um, a function available to us um, in, in JavaScript. Uh, and we can parse the values of that style sheet. And I know that doesn't look very exciting, but the, the purpose of this API is not just to be able to parse style sheets, is to be able to create our own, really create our own additions to CSS itself. I'm going to zoom that back in a bit, and we can see. What you'll be able to do is implement your own uh, constructs, something like custom functions, um, and we'll see what kind of possibilities that opens, or custom at rules in the same way that we use typefaces or media queries. Um, and even if you've used the new feature for image sizes to have multiple sizes of images on one tag, uh, CSS-like attribute values. Um, and I know that seems very technical, but think about what could you possibly do with your own custom CSS functions and CSS at rules. And when I think about what's exciting to me and what I'd like to try when this API becomes available, I think of, for example, chroma key. Imagine you could have something like Hollywood green screens, and you could drop the background um, of an image and make it transparent within CSS. You could implement the rendering engine for that uh, function and make it available within CSS. It's not SAS or less or um, any sort of uh, JavaScript polyfill. You're extending the CSS engine itself. Um, for example, you could select a frame from a GIF, which is something I'd love to try. You could create a selection of more interesting image filters. 
if we're looking at uh, at rules, you could implement your own inher inheritance for classes and, and properties in the same way that SAS-less or any CSS precompiler does it. We could create our own definitions in the same way that typeface um, is used to make fonts available globally in a document. Maybe we can create something like a color palette available widely in a document. So you extend CSS itself. This is loaded from a regular style sheet into the browser, and you have to, um, you'll be able to define the behavior um, uh, of the process and um, the parsing of each each of the rules um, on its own. Oh, here we go. And to show to show you um, um, perhaps some of the more power of when these APIs come together, and it's all about um, the different APIs and the the. I guess the, the wide range of uh, possibilities that they make available when they're combined. Um, I want to look into the properties and values API. Um, has anyone experimented with custom properties or CSS variables? A few hands. Um, so custom properties or CSS variables look something like this. They allow you to define a custom, custom looking attribute and assign a value to it. Now currently, when you do this, when you assign palette root in, um, in the root level of, or any level of your document, it becomes a variable that is, uh, that is available to you um, to use in other properties. So you can define a color and reuse it everywhere. But it's used as a string. So it uses orange as a string. It doesn't know what orange is. It doesn't know what orange does. And we just hope that when you feed orange into color maybe, or background color, uh, CSS would know what to do with this. Well, the properties, the new properties API will give you an interface to define uh, more robust uh, properties. For this example, uh, something like palette root, we can uh, tell C the, the CSS engine that palette root is a color of a type color, um, and we'll see later on wh why it's important that CSS knows the type of our values um, that it inherits from its parents, that it has a default value. Now, what that means in terms of our development is that we can set this property once, but uh, the CSS engine is aware of the value. So one advantage, for example, is that we'll be able to animate these values, because if uh, CSS, um, the CSS engine is aware of a value being a color, if we transition to, into another color, it is able to create the curve of transition between these two things. It's not just the separate unknown values that are either strings or numbers. They're, these are values with a meaning. Um, and if we're talking about values with meaning, the third um, upcoming API is the typed CSS object model. Um, and the typed CSS object model is extended um, on top of the regular CSS object model, and we'll see what that means to solve this problem. Uh, and you might have been familiar with it. Um, and that is trying to get a value out of CSS into JavaScript. Let's say I want to know what is the width of an element. Well, currently, I have to get the style sheet for that element, get the property. It'll be something like 100 pixels. It'll be a string. I'll have to split that string, drop the pixel, turn it into a number, only to get the width. And if I want to set the width back in, let's say it's calculated, I have to generate a string again, pass it into the CSS engine, which will parse it back into a number. And all this loop was just because our interface is strings, which is a very poor interface. So not only is this annoying, if you do it a lot, if you do it every time you scroll, every time the browser window changes, every time you hover over an element, it really uh, drops in performance. If you had the experience of trying to create uh, dynamically sized elements in reaction to mouse hovers or scroll, something like the Twitter header, which we'll see another implementation of later on, it becomes very, very slow. So instead, what Houdini proposes is a typed CSS object model, meaning that values have, oops, values have a type. They are numbers, they are lengths, they are transitions, they are time, they are degrees, but they have, they have a meaning and they have more context. So for example, if we want to set the width um, of an element, we initialize a new CSS length value. And it takes a number, and it takes a unit. And then we can set it back to the element, meaning that we operate in a more rich and informed context. We know that we operate in a width with unit, and in pixels that we're dealing with, width, uh, with widths or lengths in this case. Um, and what that means is that we can create more elaborate um, types or more elaborate values with less overhead. For example, the previous example of a calculation with two different units, 
just becomes uh, a new cis length value um, with a percent and a pixel value. And these are automatically comprised into a calculation, meaning we don't have to do any more string manipulation or concatting or splitting or all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's a much better API. And because we are aware of the type of the value, because we know it's a length, we can operate on it. We can do things like uh, addition or division um, in the case of lengths. In case of a transform, it's really interesting because the transform uh, string itself, the matrix of transformations, if it's a rotation or a translation or a skew or a spin, um, it becomes very lengthy. And processing that uh, with a bunch of regular exp expressions or splits in JavaScript can become very, a very lengthy process. In this case, we have a very strict interface. We create a transform, for example, and we add transformations to it. We can add a rotation, and it has a type of angle. It's a lot easier to understand what's going on. It's a much more robust interface to describe our dynamic styles. And we'll see that the, the typed CSS object model really empowers a lot of the different new features of Houdini. So now we're looking into more of these were all APIs that are available in the in the DOM or in the, in the main thread or in our main processing thread in JavaScript, meaning that we can apply uh, styles, we can read values, we can add some more features to CSS. Um, and I want to look through, um, like we talked before, how do we polyfill uh, CSS? How do we extend it? How do we compensate for the lack of features in some browsers? Uh, and really, uh, the Layout API touches upon this uh, first. So the Layout API allows you to create your own custom layouts. And it might not sound exciting, because we can do, things, do it with things like masonry today, um, or we can just do it in JavaScript. But it provides you um, with an interface that will um, be um, separate to the main thread. And it will work in sort of a worker. We'll talk about worklets um, in a bit. And it will allow you to define high performance uh, scripts that will run to generate the layout of your pages. And you can use them straight from CSS. So you can define a layout that compensates for the lack of flexbox or grid or columns or whatever it is. You can load it into, um, look, you can load it along with your application and use uh, CSS normally. Um, and these uh, layouts will be available to you. So let's look at an example. But before we look at a layout, I just want to uh, talk a bit about the way um, layouts are defined in CSS. We operate with boxes and fragments, meaning that even if we have a single line and it's within a single div, there are a few different chunks. Um, and we can use it with, for example, pseudo selectors of first letter or first word. Um, or if we had, have a few different spans within a div, you can see in here we have overline, underline, uh, and italic. And they are separate elements. They are all uh, different fragments within one box within the context of uh, the new structure of CSS. Um, so let's say that we want to create uh, a simple layout that will order elements as blocks, one after another. Well, what we're given is an uh, API where we define a class, and this is done in JavaScript, but uh, the, the end result, the display uh, layout is available through CSS. So we'll just run briefly over what the code looks like, um, and we'll talk about the benefits later. We define a new class. We define a layout, and that layout is being called in the layout stage of CSS. So right after we get all of the selectors, we go through the cascade, and we want to start placing elements around the document. Um, so we get the properties of the elements. We get their width and their height. And this function basically runs through each of the elements and places them in coordinates inside a container. Once it does that, it returns all of the values. I'm not going to run through the through the, uh, the particulars of the code, because it matters less. What matters is that we get the uh, unsorted or unplaced list of fragments or elements within a container, and we can place them within a bounding box. We know that, uh, a, let's say, a particular box is 100 pixels, and the next one is uh, each, each one of the uh, spans is 100 uh, pixels. We can draw them one after another. We can draw them next to each other. We have complete control over uh, placements of elements. And this entire class is exported and registered as a display. But what that means is that you can later use it in CSS through uh, the layout, the layout function, meaning that you can polyfill Flexbox. You can create your own layouts. Uh, the um, reference implementation implements masonry, um, if you're familiar with the uh, uh, masonry layout uh, library, much like uh, the Windows blocks, the Windows 10 blocks within CSS. So you can just use these displays in CSS 
And we'll see uh, later on where this code is actually executed to ensure that uh, you don't have a performance hit or a performance drop to be able to use uh, custom layouts. Another interesting example is the Paint API. The Paint API gives you control over um, backgrounds or uh, um, any kind of visuals that you can draw in the DOM. And what it looks like, again, it's another class that is exported to make available in CSS. So we register a new, um, a new painter. In this example, let's say a circle, um, and we get the input of an element, and we want to draw a circle in the middle of it. So much like a canvas interface, we get a subset of, um, of really canvas to be able to draw whatever we want within the element. So if we ask for the properties, um, let's say cir uh, circle color, we ask for a custom property or a variable from CSS, so we're able to um, interface between different APIs. And then we get the uh, dimensions of a particular element, and we can draw a circle in the middle. Now, I know this looks like canvas, but this is the actual drawing of CSS layers, so we can draw um, on elements, it's not a canvas. Um, it's not a canvas container. The way that it looks um, after you register a circle isn't just in CSS. You can say that the background image is a paint. You paint a circle, um, and you will have a circle in the back, and it will be in the sort of shadow DOM. It will be part of the layout. It will not be another canvas layer or any other additional element. It will just be the background that you can draw whatever you want on. So I want to show you an example of what that Paint API looks like from a uh, initial implementation of the Chrome team, you can see a few really interesting things. Is that one of the properties, we'll zoom out a bit, one of the properties offset is set as a custom variable, and that offset becomes available to the painter. And then we feed off the radius and the fill and a few uh, other custom properties to define the painter, and that painter will draw sort of a chat bubble. And you can see that it feeds off all of these parameters, CSS custom properties, into a custom paint function that draws the background of a text bubble. And it's not done um, with additional elements. It's not done with additional canvas or images. It's drawn as the actual background of the element. You can draw offsets for the carrot. You can do uh, a lot of different things. And this runs completely separately to the main thread. So this is um, the same as setting a regular background image. This is done as part of the um, CSS um, styling and rendering process. Another interesting example, that <laughs> when I saw this, it was really, um, really mind-blowing to me um, because it, it really underlines the, um, the, how much access you get into the, um, into the CSS API, into the CSS engine. You're able to control not just um, positioning or some additional properties that you then render with JavaScript, but really the way your page is rendered. You get really low-level access uh, to the rendering engine, to the layout engine, to the positioning of all these elements. You can see another example, and this is very interesting. We're drawing a QR code in, completely in CSS, so we define the paint function that renders, generates a, uh, an S, um, a QR code, and all we have to do is set a custom uh, property of QR URL, much like content in uh, before or after pseudo elements, and we set the value and we generate a QR, and we don't have to run um, SVG or any more JavaScript in the main thread. It's not a bunch of uh, divs or a table. It's drawn to the background of the container, and it's done in a very um, slimmed down version of, the, um, of a worker that is available to the painter, ensuring that these processes, even if uh, processing a QR and painting it is a complex operation, um, will run in very high performance. Another example, and the third one, is a famous Google uh, ripple effect um, from material design. Um, if you've ever tried to use uh, any of the polyfills for um, these elements, you know that they either use Canvas or SVG. They're a bit sluggish. They're very hard to predict in terms of performance. Um, in this example, and it sh um, shows not just the, uh, the ability to render static um, elements, but to create dynamic animated backgrounds that respond to um, mouse events, click events, positioning of the pointer. Um, and you can just click around and you get the ripple effect. The ripple is completely contained within the element because it's within the uh, background drawn of the element itself. So you might ask at this point, you've shown us a bunch of cool APIs, but what the, what's, the, what's the point? Well, there are three, I'd say, goals for the Houdini API or the Houdini spec and collection of APIs. The main one 
is cross-browser compatibility. Let's talk about layout or box shadow, for example, or text shadow, or any kind of visual API. If it's missing, if it's not available in browsers that you are targeting with your projects today, you can write a very um, uh, isolated snippet of JavaScript, feed it into a worker, um, and make that interface available um, across browsers. That's true, it's only available across browsers that support Houdini, but once we hit a baseline of support for the JavaScript APIs, you will never have a problem of CSS compatibility again. You can implement your own Flexbox, you can implement your own uh, border radius, you can do whatever you want, and you won't have to trust um, adoption of um, either vendor implementation or adoption by your users of later versions of browsers or maybe using greenfield browsers. The other, the other benefit is really high performance styles. So like I mentioned, these snippets, these um, additional um, layout engines, they run in completely separate threads. They are registered as workers. Um, and I'm not going to get into workers now because that's more JavaScript land. But they run separate to the main thread on a very uh, slim down subset of JavaScript. Um, which ensures very high performance compared to running masonry on your own or trying to position elements with, I don't know, jQuery or React um, and doing this layout in, um, in reaction to every um, browser refresh, to every um, scroll or uh, position of the mouse or uh, resize of the window. So they happen at a much earlier part of the process and a much lower level of the rendering uh, interface in the browser. And the last bit, that's probably the most creative, is that you can implement your own features. You can really go wild. Um, and you can try maybe uh, adding new things that might be exciting to the CSS spec and add them um, into um, a proposal to CSS 4 or 5 or 6. Um, and you can really try and build your own styling, your own style sheets, your own CSS that will fit your projects. So can you use it now? Well, no, you can't. Uh, none of this is available. Some Mock or reference implementations are available under the Canary Wharf, uh, Canary Wharf, the Canary flag um, in Chrome, um, and you can test them out. You can see the videos, you can see the code behind these reference implementations, but most of this is in the development versions of Chrome and Firefox um, and Microsoft Safari. Uh, Houdini is a very uh, cross industry team. And it's a lot of effort. Um, there's a lot of effort being made to, to push the progress of these APIs. What you can do now, though, um, and that has to do with the fact that we are in a community conference, really is to get involved. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be here talking to you about an API that's not available. And this is important, because at the end of the day, we're the ones doing web development and web design. We'll be the ones using Houdini. So what we think, what we want, what we don't like, really matters, and it matters to developer advocates of these browsers. It matters to the development teams building Chrome and Firefox and Safari and Edge now. Um, so we should uh, take active part. We should say what we think. This stuff is all on GitHub. Um, all of the draft rep official draft report repositories, all of the uh, minutes from the meetings, you can uh, go on and check it out. You can make a pull request. You can open an issue. You can contribute or just say what you think. Um, yeah, so this is coming, I'd say, probably in the next year or two, uh, but we can help steer the boat. We can make sure that Houdini, this really new and broad change to the way we do CSS, is something that really answers our needs, that is good for us to use as the community, as the people who will be using it probably daily. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just want to make a few thank yous. Um, first of all, to the CSS Conf team um, for having me. It's a great honor for you for listening. Um, for the Houdini team, obviously I'm not building this uh, myself, uh, but I'm happy to uh, share my excitement about where the web is going. Um, and that is it. So thank you very much for listening.